Hi, today I'd like to talk to you about testing strategies for AngularJS. This is a topic that is really near to my heart because I didn't have a big background in test-driven development or even just the experience with understanding how to test. Uh, and about three years ago, I got the awesome opportunity to pair with a friend of mine, Justin Searles, for a good six months on a project. And he really introduced me to the idea of testing uh, JavaScript and testing web applications and test-driven development. We're not going to cover test-driven development today because I think that that's uh, a topic that's better suited to learning in a pairing environment where you can actually pair with somebody. So what we're going to look at is uh, some strategies that you can use um, and maybe just elevate the discussion a little bit more than just tools and talk about uh, the ideas and maybe some questions you can ask your team or you can ask the people that you work with uh, to get a conversation about um, some nuance in understanding how you test. So let's look at the outline. Uh, just a quick note, this is a um, follow-on to the series on AngularJS screencasts that I've already produced. Uh, you don't have to have watched all the other ones, um, but there will be some context that I'm referencing uh, from the previous videos. Mainly, we're just going to be working with the same sample app. So if you've seen the introduction to AngularJS, end-to-end uh, security or front-end workflows with AngularJS, any of those would probably give you enough context to move forward. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about why testing is hard and how the terminology that's out there for uh, testing strategies and um, different techniques and tools and things that we use uh, is hard for people that are new to this arena. Um, after that, we're going to look at uh, why strategies are probably a better thing to focus our energies on instead of talking about tools, uh, and this idea of budgeting for reality and tests, which is really the, the most important thing, I think, when coming up with a testing strategy for your application. We'll look at some of uh, the boundaries in an Angular app and uh, the talk, uh, or the previous topic on budgeting for reality and tests uh, will inform us about um, how many of those boundaries we want to cross in our different types of tests. And then uh, as we look at a couple specific examples for Angular, we're going to look at this idea of low resolution uh, tests for controllers, directives, and services, and high resolution tests where we're actually going to spin up a browser using uh, Protractor, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the focus of this screencast is definitely not going to be on tools, but there are some tools that we're going to use. So along the way, uh, we'll take a look at Testem, which is a framework agnostic test runner. Uh, another uh, tool that we're going to look at is Jasmine. You're probably familiar with it, so I'm really not going to spend a lot of time uh, touching on the, the finer points of, of setup and things like that. Uh, Protractor, which is a new um, end-to-end test runner for Angular. It's Angular specific and it has a lot of cool features. Uh, that we'll be going through as we work through a couple end-to-end -end tests. And then Lineman, which you've seen if you watch the front-end workflows with Grunt and AngularJS video, uh, which is a productivity tool that um, the guys at Test Double, which is where I work, uh, put together for you to be able to build rich client web applications. So let's kick things off by talking about why testing is hard. Uh, when I first came into uh, test-driven development and just getting introduced to the idea of testing three years ago, there was all this termino terminology floating around. Um, there was X-unit test patterns, there was uh, test doubles and mocks and spies and all these different words that I didn't really understand. And I think uh, that is intimidating to people that come to testing uh, for the first time. And they really don't understand um, that the high-level question that we want to talk about isn't uh, or ask when it's related to testing isn't um, whether I should use uh, spying or mocking or should I mock or should I not mock. Uh, those are sort of more advanced questions. The, the real question that we want to ask is how much reality uh, does my test need? And my coworker, I mentioned Justin Searles, he has a really good presentation and I'll put a link uh, in the video description on Speaker Deck. Uh, talking about reality um, being expensive is a better way of thinking about mock objects. And he goes through uh, sort of this idea of um, reality in terms of tests and, and how it's expensive. And so he had this uh, idea that um, you may have seen something like uh, this testing triangle before, and I've actually replaced the specific names of the types of tests because I don't think it's important when you're first coming to understanding testing. 
Um, I think it's more important to ask the question, how much reality does my test need? Because if you think about uh, a test that crosses um, more boundaries, you know, where you're actually spinning up a browser to test your Angular application or whatever application, that's a super high fidelity test. That's really close to reality, right? That's, um, you know, at the top we've got Mario here in, uh, in real life where, you know, he represents maybe somebody on your team's going and manually testing uh, your application. That's sort of um, the smallest point of the pyramid. We should probably do some manual verification, but it's super expensive to do that uh, and to automate that. Um, those tests really verify that we uh, built the right thing because they they uh, are as close to reality as we can get. Um, but we should really consider that as part of our testing strategy and budget accordingly. So that's why it's at the top of the pyramid. It's a smaller chunk. We should have some of those tests in our application um, and in our testing strategy, but they shouldn't make up the bulk. And on the flip side, uh, you know, we've got uh, 8-bit Mario from the original NES era here, and this represents sort of the bulk of what your testing strategy should be made up of, which is low fidelity tests that are cheap to run and automate, that are, are really good at verifying the behavior um, of individual components in your system, but not necessarily uh, all the pieces. And so, you know, understanding that we need to ask this question, how much reality does my test need, uh, is important when devising a testing strategy for your team. So with that, let's talk about some boundaries. Um, that you might run into in an Angular application because it's important to understand what all the pieces are uh, in uh, an Angular application. So let's talk about boundaries. So when we think about what happens when uh, a user spins up an Angular application, they're probably going to use their browser. So that's sort of the first level. And then there's a boundary between that and the ng app directive, which if you've watched the intro video and the other videos, um, I covered what the ng app directory is. So Angular is going to look for that directive in order to bootstrap the app. And then the next boundary, you know, maybe there's a route. Uh, you don't have to use a router in Angular, but maybe you've got uh, a router in place. And so there's a route that fires. Uh, and then it's going to probably render a template into an ng view that you've got. So there's another boundary. Um, it's got that template. That's a boundary. Uh, there's some directives in that template that the Angular uh, compiler and linker has to go through and sort of uh, look at the HTML and instantiate all of the pieces uh, for the for the template so that the, the dynamic two-way binding can happen and things like that. So that's another boundary. Uh, and then a, a controller probably gets instantiated. So there's yet another boundary that we're going to have to work with. Um, inside a controller, we've got a scope. And then there's various services that you might be injecting into that controller. There's another boundary. Uh, so for example, HTTP or maybe dollar resource, things like that. Um, and then behind HTTP and dollar resource, kind of before uh, any requests get made to our backend, there's actually something called HTTP backend. And this is important because we're going to take a look at, with our testing strategies, uh, at why Angular chose as a design decision to include this HTTP backend. If you're familiar with, um, you know, jQuery.ajax, uh, and maybe you've built a backbone application or another uh, low-level app, even just with like uh, vanilla jQuery. Um, one interesting thing is that there's some private methods in under the hood, but there's nothing like a concrete abstraction like this HTTP backend. And uh, it's one of the design decisions that makes Angular really nice to test. And so after we get to the HTTP backend, we're probably going to forward off to XHR, so to the native um, APIs that the browser vendors provide for communicating uh, asynchronously with our, our backend. And that's sort of the next boundary is to our web server. Uh, we've probably got some sort of ORM, some sort of object relational mapper. Uh, and then that's going to generate queries, which are going to hit our database. So those are all of the boundaries uh, in our application. So when we talk about how much reality we want in a testing strategy, you know, maybe um, thinking in terms of lo-fi, uh, a test might cover a couple of these boundaries. So maybe, um, you know, from browser all the way over to directive. Maybe that's, uh, you're going to come up with a testing strategy uh, when testing directives, and those are the boundaries that you want to cover. Um, you're probably not going to hit all of the pieces in between here. Uh, maybe you're going to uh, cover the browser. Uh, maybe you're just going to cover the directive directly, and a template, uh, and a controller. Maybe, maybe you want to do that. Um, maybe you just want to test the controller and the scope for a controller test. Uh, so there's 
all kinds of different things. Maybe for a service, you actually want to use um, the service directly, uh, a scope uh, to manipulate uh, with the service. Maybe you actually want to test the HTTP backend in relation to those things. So when we talk about boundaries and the amount of reality, um, these are sort of examples of lo-fi uh, pieces that we might want to test. And we'll take a look at some specific examples. When we talk about hi-fi, we're basically talking about you know all of the, all of the uh, boundaries that, uh, that we can. Um, so browser all the way through to da, 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 database. Uh, and that uh, amount of reality is really good at verifying that what we built is correct but it's not really easy to automate. It's not super um, easy to maintain, especially if you are asserting too much in those types of tests. Um, so that uh, is about as much as I wanna say about boundaries. Going forward, we're gonna take a look at the app that we built previously, so I'm just gonna start that up and we'll get started with uh, just a quick tour of, of what's in that application. So I'm going to run Lineman, uh, which is the productivity tool we covered in front-end workflows with Grunt and Angular in the second half of that screencast. And that's just going to spin up a local Express.js server with our app. And if you remember from previous uh, screencasts, or if you don't, there's no requirement to the username and password here. There's just a simple app um, that's going to redirect to... Uh, the home page, when I mouse over these images, I get some dynamic behavior happening, and I'm going to log out, uh, and things like that. There we go. And I've added a third route in here that we're going to use, um, which right now is just returning me the data, um, so some books. And we're going to look at uh, what that route shows on the screen. I just open up the router, right, I had to change it to list of books. There we go. So fetching from a, a book service to render some books on the screen. So uh, the list of books, um, the login page, and the home page. Nothing real crazy. Uh, so we're going to look at some testing strategies to see how all of these pieces work. So let's start with um, the login page. So we've got our app definition here in the Angular module. Uh, we've got a route provider set up to listen for the login route. And I've got HTML5 mode enabled, which is why you don't see the hash in the URL. So I can actually click around here and go to uh, login. Um, and the lineman is actually simulating HTML5 push state for us. So that's one of the cool features in lineman that you can use when you're developing your apps. Uh, just wanted to point that out in case people were confused. So let's look at uh, what kind of behavior is happening uh, at the controller level. So let's look at that login controller and see that there's not a whole lot. Uh, if you remember from the previous screencasts, we built an authentication service uh, that had some various properties about how it interacted with this, the back end. Uh, and there was a, a login form. I'll just pull this to the side here so that you can see if I go log out. There we go. You can see that login form with the username and password field. And when the user logs in, we redirect them to the home page. So that's basically the functionality we want to test first. And the testing strategy that we're going to use to test um, this amount of code is the low fidelity. So not a lot of reality, um, but that's going to mean that this test is super cheap to run and super uh, cheap to automate. And so we can kind of have them running continuously. So one of the cool things that we have uh, in Lineman is this sort of opinionated directory structure that gets scaffolded for you when you create an app with Lineman. And spec is one of the directories. So if we take a look at our app code, we've got JS, we've got uh, controllers, directives, resources, and services, which should be familiar from the previous screencasts. And we've got our spec folder set up to mirror that. So let's add a new spec for uh, the login page, or the login controller rather, so we'll call it login controller spec.js. And we're going to be using Jasmine, I mentioned that was uh, one of the tools, and Jasmine gives us two uh, keywords to work with um, our specs for describing them. Uh, describe, so I'm going to describe the login controller, 
and it just takes a function as its uh, second argument. And then the other uh, cool thing that we can use is it, and it is where we define our behavior. Um, and so the thing that we want to verify about this test, uh, and this is sort of one way I like to uh, operate, is I just start enumerating test cases uh, to describe the behavior that uh, I want when I'm building my system. I'm just going to split my window in half here and put the, the, the code under test at the bottom. So I want to describe uh, what successfully logging in looks like. So let's do that. Uh, and to do that, one of the, the first sort of things that comes to mind when you're talking about testing Angular code is, well, how do I actually get at that code under test? And this is relevant because Angular um, hides away or encapsulates things inside of this idea of angular.module. And when you're actually poking at the page, if we go back to Chrome DevTools, um, I can take a look at the state of Angular in the global here. Take a look, and you can see all of the sort of public functions that are available off of Angular, but there's not really any easy way to um, get, get a hold of uh, the actual module or the code. I mean, I can look into the sources tab, and I can see all that code, so I can go to controllers and look at the login controller and see that. But I need to be able to get a hold of this function inside of here so that I can start poking at it. And that's one of the first things that you'll run into uh, when you're writing sort of low fidelity tests um, that are trying to isolate a, a specific unit of functionality. And so the first thing that we need to do is we uh, actually need to make that available to our test. And Angular has um, some built-in helpers that give you the ability to do that. And one of those is a global um, function. The full uh, reference to it is angular.mock.module. Uh, and we'll just call it module for short because it's available as an alias. And the first thing that we want to do is say, uh, hey, Angular, um, we want you to make available the, the stuff that's inside of that app module for this test. Uh, and that gets us access you know, to this level of code. And so that's one way that we can uh, grab the, the unit of functionality under test for our small low fidelity test. The next thing we need to do is we need to figure out how we're actually going to grab this specific controller. And Angular's got a, another uh, couple of things that we can do uh, to grab that. And these are all available in Angular mocks. So let's just open that really quickly because I think it's useful to take a look at this. And uh, there we go. So at the low level, uh, ng mock or Angular mock is basically a set of pieces of the Angular architecture that are um, faked out so that when you're testing your Angular code, uh, for example, here's that HTTP backend I talked about, um, that you're not actually going to make XHR requests. You know, we looked at that boundary uh, between HTTP backend and XHR. Uh, so when you're running in uh, test mode, Angular swaps out this real HTTP backend with a mock HTTP backend. Uh, and basically, all that means is it's reducing the amount of reality in our test, right? So that it's a lot cheaper and easier to run, uh, and we can verify uh, bits and pieces about this uh, specific uh, unit under test. So in order to uh, grab the module, we use module, and we say app. That uh, goes in Angular mocks and... Uh, if we look for module, angular.mock.module, we can see right here that there's a couple of things that that does for us. Um, it basically sets up, uh, it's, it's available on the window object, so it's globally available, and it sets up um, a context for our current spec that's running. So uh, it, it will tear down automatically so that uh, before each spec, we're setting the context of the code that we want to test, which is our app module. But then after each spec, it, it'll tear down and remove that so we don't have any test pollution between test runs. So let's let's grab the context of our, um, our actual controller. And so to do that, we need to instantiate it. And the next keyword that we're going to interact with is something called inject. And this is, uh, if you've watched the other screencasts, this is the way that you inject dependencies uh, using Angular's dependency injection. And we're going to say we want to inject a function, uh, and we want to inject the controller um, in this argument. 
Uh, we're also going to need a root scope because our controller, as you can see, one of the dependencies is a scope. Uh, and then the rest of the things I'm going to enumerate are just the other pieces that we need to create uh, a version of this controller in our test. So let's do that. So when we say inject, uh, when we say module, that sets up the context for our module under test. Uh, just for this test, it'll be torn, torn down after so that there's no test pollution. And we can say inject and pass it a function. Uh, and all of these specific dependencies are available um, because the uh, ones with prefix with dollar signs are just part of Angular's core framework. And this authentication service is available on our uh, app module. So that's how we can grab the dependencies, but how do we uh, instantiate it, the controller? That's where this controller uh, comes into play. So we want to say, uh, we want to set up a controller, we want to set up the login controller, and this, you can see this string matches the, the name that I've defined the controller as up here. And then we're going to want to pass it some uh, properties when we instantiate that controller. Uh, we want to pass the scope. And we want to say root scope dot new. That gives us a new instance of the scope that is set up automatically for you by Angular. Uh, we want to pass that location in, like so, and our authentication service. And so now, uh, if we spin up Lineman's test runner, which is called testum, which you can do if you go to the command line and type Lineman spec. So we've got lineman running here so that it uh, pulls in file changes. Uh, looks like I've got a syntax error in my spec. So let's just run JS hint on this thing. Looks like I'm missing a line 13. Oh, missing a, one of them. Let's run it again. There we go. Now is it happy? Good. So no tests were run, but uh, at least my, I don't have any syntax errors. So let's get back to describing successfully logging in. Again, this is our uh, unit of functionality with the controller. So let's take a look exactly what happens. There's this method called login on the scope. And when login gets called from uh, somewhere in the DOM, there's a, an ng click handler in our login page. The authentication services login method is going to get called. It's going to pass the value of scope.credentials, which is an ng model that's bound. And then when that's finished, it, it returns a promise because under the hood, the authentication service is using HTTP, which returns a promise. So with those credentials, we're going to log in. And then when we have successfully logged in, we'll call this unsuccess callback, which results in the user getting redirected to the home page. So that's just the behavior we want to describe. So let's do that. Um, so successfully logging in, it should redirect you uh, to home. To home. So again, you know, with this idea of boundaries in mind and the amount of reality that we have in our test, I don't actually want to spin up the DOM and insert uh, all of the pieces necessary to do this. I just want to sort of simulate what uh, the boundaries are from the controller layer to our th authentication service and uh, assert that the location um, dot path method was successfully called uh, after the authentication service successfully logged in. So that's the, the, uh, the, the testing strategy or the idea that we're going to use here. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we need in our before each to make some things available uh, on the scope that uh, this Jasmine test runs in. And the first thing that we're going to interact with is uh, the location. So we can just assign it to this. And now we have uh, doing this is going to make it available inside of our it block down on line 19 there. We're also going to want to grab the HTTP, back, HTTP backend. Um, and we're going to need to uh, inject that in this injector here. And we're going to need the scope because we're going to want to make some assertions uh, about the scope. So let's do this. Let's move that line up. And then we can just say this.scope. And those are the pieces that we uh, need to start anyway. 
So because Angular provided this HTTP backend, if we just go back and look at our boundaries, um, when running under test, this piece is going to be fake uh, because we included Angular mocks in our uh, in our test helper setup, which you know I mentioned before is a really nice design decision. Uh, it turns out that um, because of that we can actually make assertions against the backend and uh, sort of train it to respond to our requests as if it was a real backend in our test. And this is pretty cool. It allows us to um, isolate uh, with less reality, um, but not have to have our tests be super complicated in order to do that. So let's look at uh, how we're gonna how we're gonna assert what's happening. So let's in investigate um, that authentication service dot login method is really what what's gonna get called when we call our scope dot login, uh, and that's gonna call HTTP POST with uh, slash login and any credentials that get sent to it. And so when we talk about uh, testing strategies, one of the first things I learned. Um, when I learned testing was this idea of um, arrange, act, and assert uh, for how you want to structure your tests. So let's break our it um, into those three things. Let's do arrange first. And so the first step that we want to do in our arrange is we want to grab that back end and we want to say uh, you're going to expect a post. These are just helpers that are built in. You can check out the documentation. And the value that uh, you're going to expect is you're going to expect a post to slash login, and then uh, we're going to say you want to grab the credentials. Um, those credentials are going to be on there because uh, right here we've instantiated our login controller. And so the scope is really the piece that we want to make assertions against. You can see here on line two, when that login controller gets instantiated, there's a username and a password property uh, that gets set here. So those are what we're going to assert that the HTTP backend got an expect post passed to it. And then we're going to say, uh, and when that happens, we want to respond with a 200. Because at this point, we don't really care what the response is. Uh, we're just testing that uh, the plumbing in our um, logging controller works as advertised. So that's our arrange step. Uh, what's next is um, our act step in that arrange act assert. And to get this to work, we're going to need to interact with our controller somehow. And the only publicly available function uh, on our controller is this login method, because that's what's bound in the login template, which I can just open here. So we can see that uh, when the ng submit um, directive uh, is detected, it's going to bind the login function to the submit event. And that login function exists on the scope in that controller. And so that's the uh, that's our entry point for the test in our act step. So we're going to say this dot scope dot login in order to act. And then once that's in place, we want to do some assertions. Um, the second piece of act that we need to do isn't actually related to our, our code under test, but it's related to um, the HTTP backend. So because uh, the nature of HTTP backend is that um, it's asynchronous and all of the Requests that go through uh, dollar HTTP or dollar resource when you're working with Angular are asynchronous. Uh, they re return promises, which is really nice, so you can compose them and treat them uh, your code as if it was synchronous. Um, but the HTTP backend has uh, sort of mocked out the idea of that asynchronicity. And there's an internal cache of deferred objects. Uh, and if you're familiar with the Q library, uh, which is a uh, the Angular implementation of another popular promise library, uh, you'll know that um, one of the properties of a deferred is, is the ability to resolve. And so in order to um, properly get our HTTP backend to respond to the request that uh, login is going to send through the authentication service, we need to call flush. Uh, so those are the two things that you uh, will work with. And we'll take a look a little bit later about uh, or at some other strategies that you can work with with HTTP backend. So we've arranged our uh, server to respond uh, or to expect a post and then respond with a 200. We've acted by calling scope.login, which is going to trigger that request. And then we're saying, OK, I need to respond with the server. And then now we want to verify some of the behavior. So let's use Jasmine's expect. Um, and we're going to say we want to expect some redirect function uh, to have been called with Home. So if we do that, uh, we can see that we got a, a failure here. Expected a spy, but got undefined in testum. Testum is awesome because 
I can fire up Firefox, for example, and I can connect to uh, localhost 7357. And now I've got two browsers that my tests are going to run. And I can en hit enter and they'll rerun again. And whenever my files change, uh, Lineman is set up so that it'll automatically do that. So one of the nice ways I like to work in my test uh, workflow is to sort of put this window near the bottom and then grab um, my code window. And I'm doing this at a lower resolution, so you can't see all of this. Uh, but now if I say uh, foo, for example, and I hit save, you'll notice that those uh, browsers all got refreshed, and I can see the results in my terminal. So I don't have to really switch to the browsers, but if I want to debug, I can. So that's Testem, and that's as much as I'm going to show you about Testem. If you use Lineman, uh, like I said, you get that Lineman spec command. Uh, so while your app is running, it'll detect file changes, and uh, it'll work for you. There, it reconnected to those browsers that were already open. The thing that we want to verify is that uh, our, our redirect to uh, login got called or to authenticate, uh, got called, and we get redirected to the home. Uh, so let's make uh, this location uh, object, and let's say reader, this dot redirect equals spy on uh, location path. And what that's going to do is, uh, if we look at the test now, hey, we're green. Um, so let's understand exactly what this is doing. Basically, what we're doing is when we inject location, we get a copy of the location object from Angular, which has one of the methods on it is path. And if we go through uh, our login controller, we can see that when that authentication service logged in with this, the credentials and was successful, it's going to call this on login success callback, which calls location.path uh, home. And so in our test, that spy method is basically saying, um, swap out the behavior of location.path or replace the function with a fake function. And the spy has some properties that we can assert about it uh, in order to verify the behavior of this code under test. So we can say, um, you know, given that we've arranged our server to expect this, we've called, we've acted, called that login method, we've flushed out the server to get the response from the fake server, uh, and then uh, we can expect that that redirect, which is just a local variable, that's just what I'm calling location path. We could call this uh, location path, if you wanted to, uh, to, to have been called with home. So this is a low uh, budget uh, react test in terms of reality. There's not a lot of uh, reality here. But what it does by us is we've now asserted that uh, our, our code in here works um, as we expect it to, just within this, this one module, uh, this login controller. And that's pretty pretty powerful. And we can uh, run those tests, you know, in browsers. We could spin up Phantom JS if we didn't run run them in the browser, and they'll run pretty fast. So that is sort of on the low reality end of the spectrum. And you may have heard of something called the Angular Scenario Runner for uh, sort of this idea of end-to-end -end tests. And um, so what I'm going to show you is something called Protractor. And Protractor uh, is a project that a Googler um, named Julie Ralph has been working on. Uh, and it's a really, really cool, different approach to um, testing uh, Angular applications. And it sits on top of something called WebDriver, which is, uh, if you've heard of Selenium, it's a, a, a interface for interacting with Selenium. And the specifics aren't uh, super important. I basically just want to show you how you can set up uh, Protractor and some of the features that it gives you. So we tested our controller. Let's actually verify, you know, going back to this idea of boundaries, we've got our lo-fi, we verified, uh, we got a piece of our app, we got a specific controller um, over through to scope, we covered a service, so we've got maybe that much uh, reality, that many boundaries being tested. Uh, we did kind of cover over into HTTP backend, so that sort of slice through what I've got highlighted there in terms of text is, is what that login spec covered. So now we want to uh, build a test that basically covers all of this, um, except the database part. Uh, but we do want to hit the web server that's running in our little lineman app uh, so that we can verify that um, logging in works as expected. So let's do that. Uh, so the way that you add uh, Protractor is you're going to want to add it to your package JSON. So I've uh, installed it with npm here. 
Here's Protractor 061 at the time of recording of this screencast. Uh, and so to do that, uh, I'm just going to quit out of Testum. I did npm install Protractor save. And I'm not going to do it now, but that's what pulled it into my package JSON. And uh, that'll pull in Protractor. And you can see it inside of node modules here. Uh, and so the config file that um, Protractor gives you is looks like this. You just export a config object. And there's a couple of properties that you're going to need to set up. One is the Selenium Server Standalone, which you can do with Homebrew. And I'll have instructions in the readme on how to install that. But it's basically as simple as brew install Selenium Selenium Standalone. Uh, you'll also need Chrome Driver. Selenium, by default, I uh, used to drive Firefox as its browser. And Chrome Driver is available so that you can fire up Chrome with it. And so thinking in terms of the amount of reality that we want, uh, this test is actually going to fire up a browser and actually going to hit our app and actually uh, sort of poke at the different things uh, in order to uh, verify some behavior. So uh, we can either tell uh, uh, Protractor where our Selenium server um, standalone file is, which port we want it to run on, and where Chrome Driver is. And if we do that, it'll actually spin, its, spin itself up on its own. So let's do that first. I've got uh, these paths here um, set up, and it's going to spin up Chrome. It's going to go to localhost 8000, which happens to map to uh, the port that my Lineman server is running on. If I reboot up Lineman, you'll see. 8,000. Uh, so we would want the actual you know, web server for our application to be up and running when uh, we're going to start up this, this other test. And uh, we're going to point it to that base URL, and we're going to point it to which specs. So the first one uh, we're going to write is called login spec. So let's do that. Let's take a look at this spec E2E folder that I've got here. So the first spec folder, I've got that login controller spec. And let's look at spec E2E and make another one here called loginspec.js. Um, the difference between our uh, spec that we just wrote here and the spec that we're going to write now is that um, this spec runs in the context of the browser, and the E2E spec that we're going to use Protractor for is going to run in the context of Node.js. Um, and so we're going to see how that works. So the first thing that we need to do uh, is we need to grab Protractor. Since we have it installed, it's available to nodes require facility. So we can just say, I'm going to grab Protractor. Uh, the second thing that we need to do is we need to grab Protractor's wrapper around some of Jasmine's constructs. constructs. And uh, I'm not going to dig into this too much, but basically the Protractor um, consists of a couple of helpers that wrap the basic Jasmine constructs. So this test is going to look a lot uh, very similar to what we already had in the previous test. Um, we're going to describe the app at a top level, because this test is going to spin up the browser. Uh, we're going to assign a local variable um, called ptor, which stands for protractor. Uh, and the names of these aren't super important. So let's describe visiting the login page, where we're going to actually spin up the browser and visit that page. First thing we do is we interact with that uh, using uh, ptor.get slash. So that's going to tell the browser to go to the root of our application. Uh, so once we've done that, actually I wanted this in a before each. Um, let's describe uh, when the user logs in. Let's take a look at this behavior. So I can log in as whoever. So when I log in, I get there and I have this default message that's on the home page. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna write my protractor test so that uh, it actually does that. Uh, so we're gonna go there. Um, when the user logs in, it should redirect me to the home page, uh, and I should see a message. And that is you know a lot more reality and a lot more boundaries that we're covering uh, in this protractor test. Protractor has uh, a library available and an interface. That's what this, um, oh, I know what I'm missing. I need to uh, I need to actually assign the value of that thing. So this was a describe. I need to say ptor.equals 
uh, protractor.getInstance, and that's going to get me the instance of the Selenium web driver uh, and the protractor wrapper around a lot of the web driver hooks. Uh, and this is going to be wrapped. Tab that in. And now I can put my before each with my ptor. Get slash. So when the user logs in, it should redirect me to the home page and I should see a message. And so one of the things you're going to want to do is interact with the pieces of uh, the UI on the page. So in this case, I want to actually be able to um, tell the browser to fill in the username, fill in the password, uh, and hit that login button. So let's see how we would do that. And that uh, works with a couple of ptor uh, functions. The first one, we can tell it to find an element. And we have a strategy that we can use to find that element uh, with the protractor library. So we want to find it by input. Uh, and if we open up that login, let's move that over and open up our login HTML. Let's split it that way. We can see that there's a couple of pieces of information here. And if you've used end-to-end -to -end test uh, tools before, you, you might have used a DOM selector, so like an ID on this input to select uh, to be able to manipulate the browser. The cool thing about Protractor is it's got these strategies for selecting uh, elements that are aware of Angular bindings. So when we say Protractor.by input, what that's actually doing uh, is looking for an ng model attribute. So we can actually just grab um, credentials.username which is pretty cool. Uh, we can say send keys to send a specific uh, set of values there. Let's do rel. Uh, let's do the same thing for the password. And these values don't matter. Uh, the next thing we want to do, so if we have those values filled in, uh, we want to uh, submit the form. So let's... Uh, find that element and using a different strategy we're going to say uh, I want to find an element by ID so sort of using just the DOM selector um, login and I'm going to call click on that thing and that should basically get me uh, as far as as to the next part of the page so let's uh, run that and see what happens uh, so the way that you do that is node modules protractor bin protractor and then you pass it your config so we want config spec e2e uh, just to remind you that that config looks like this and because I uncommented these lines uh, protractor is just automatically gonna fire up so let's see how that works so it's gonna start up selenium standalone which takes a little bit of time there we go there it fired up Chrome it's filling in the information, and I don't actually have any assertions, but uh, it didn't fail, and you saw that it pulled in the, um, or it filled in the form field. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and, you know, again, we've got these strategies that we can select elements, we can select them with some Angular intelligence, and I'm not going to cover all of the Protractor uh, things, but you should definitely investigate it, because Protractor is, at some point, going to replace the... Uh, Parma scenario runner, the Angular scenario runner. Um, if you check out the Protractor issues on GitHub, you'll see that. So let's make an assertion about this thing because we uh, we actually want to be able to to verify that 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 was working. We want to um, find that uh, message element. So if we're on the login page, go here. We want to find this message element and. Uh, verify that that value is set. And that's going to cover a whole bunch of very, uh, uh, boundaries. It's going to cover the home controller, which if you remember from the previous screencasts, we had the scope message. Um, so that's going to cover, you know, did we get redirected? Did we get uh, the right template rendered? Did that controller get instantiated? Did the value on the scope get set, the message in this case? Um, and we can assert all of that uh, and, and have a high level of fidelity for this test. So let's grab uh, a different str strategy for grabbing this um, information. So I, I said before, Protractors is aware of how Angular operates. So let's take a look at that home HTML template. And we can see that, uh, that the place that that message lives that we want to assert against 
is right here in this div with a class of alert box. And so we can grab that. Um, so we could grab this by by CSS class, but then you know we get an array of elements and we have to index in and figure out which one it is. We could add an ID, uh, but one of the problems I've seen with sort of high fidelity tests is designers will come in and they really want uh, these things to be flexible, um, to not be able to or to be bound to a specific class uh, or an ID. And if you've got um, developers using class attributes and ID attributes as hooks for your high fidelity test runner, uh, it can definitely make those tests more brittle. Protractor solves that problem by giving us a strategy to select elements that is aware of angular bindings. So I can say by binding and actually just pass it this string. So if we go back here and say protractor.bybinding and pass it that, that's another strategy that I can use that isn't coupled to any particular um, you know, class attribute or ID attribute. And so it should be much, much less brittle uh, for designers who are going to come in and modify these templates and change things, which is really, really, really cool. Uh, that's, that's an awesome thing and should make your designers very happy on your team. So after we grab that, we want to grab the text. Um, and then the other cool thing that Protractor does is it wraps a bunch of the functionality uh, that would normally make you have to write async tests uh, in Jasmine using the runs and weights. Uh, and it wraps those in promises. So we think we get a, a venable that we can pass. So we can pass it a, a callback, which is going to contain that text. Uh, and then now we can make our assertion, our, our assertion. So let's fail the test first. Let's expect that that text uh, equals foobar. And we'll rerun our protractor test. And after this, this run, I'll show you uh, one of the techniques that you can use to, uh, if you're going to be running these tests frequently, to avoid having to wait for this spin-up time. So there we go. We got a failure, uh, and it gives you a nice stack trace and a message here. So um, my Angular app visiting the login page when the user logs in should redirect me to the home page, and I should see a message. That's my uh, all of those strings of the describes and its sort of stuck together in the output from Protractor, and we get a message that says, uh, you know, expected. Um, mousing over these images to see a directive at work equals foo bar. So that, you know, obviously that's working. Uh, let's grab that text and let's make it pass. And let's use a different strategy for starting up uh, the Selenium uh, standalone server. Uh, so you can actually do this. Uh, you can say java-jar, if you've got Java on your system, point it to Selenium server uh, standalone, that jar file, which port you want to run it on. Again, these are all things that are in that config file. There's 4444, uh, there's the path to Chrome driver and a flag that says you're going to use Chrome driver. And if we set that up, it's going to launch uh, a Selenium standalone server that's just going to sit there and wait. And so now, uh, once that's done, I can go back here and comment these out. And I can just say, hey, Protractor, I've already got Selenium running, so just use this, uh, this hub, this web driver hub. And so now, if we go here and say, uh, run that. It's already using the hub, so they start up a lot faster. And you can see that we get our super high fidelity tests running. Um, and we can just leave that running. And, uh, you know, high fidelity tests, again, I said, are, are typically pretty expensive to run. Uh, this test asserts quite a bit about our system uh, in terms of reality. It's, you know, crossing a bunch of boundaries, like I had selected here. Um, not 100% reality, but it's still pretty cheap. And Protractor makes it very easy. Uh, I mentioned before, it's, it's specific to Angular, but it makes it very uh, easy to sort of manipulate the state of our app just by using these different strategies for selecting things um, that are typically sort of cumbersome if you're just used to writing uh, high fidelity specs with, um, with Selenium. We have one directive in this app which uh, is responsible for showing this message when we hover over these. Let's test that really quick. So let's add another test here. And instead of uh, JavaScript, I'm going to do this one in CoffeeScript. And some of you might not be fans of CoffeeScript, and that's OK. But I think it provides some advantages in terms of uh, terseness. And uh, we've got a couple helpers that I'll showcase as well. Spec.coffee. So let's open that up. One of the helpers that uh, Justin Searles wrote is called Jasmine Given. 
you can take a look at. If you've used RSpec and, and tested in Ruby before, one of the really nice things uh, about it is uh, the ability to split out our arrange act and assert into given when then. So, you know, here's a really good example. Give, given a number 24, when uh, I times that number by 2, uh, I add 1 to that number, then I expect that number uh, to be 50. And the nice thing about uh, CoffeeScript is it just really reduces the amount of noise that we have uh, in our spec. Uh, so, you know, if we take a look at this login controller spec, um, we can see that there's quite a bit of noise in there. Uh, when we use CoffeeScript, we can get rid of that. And we've got some Sublime Text helpers that you can actually use. Uh, so I can hit Des, and it'll give me a Describe here. Uh, I can hit Tab, and uh, it'll give me the, the block already defined. So let's write a test for our directive. Um, shows message when hovered. Let's open up the implementation of that. If you're familiar with this from the previous videos, you know that this is an attribute directive. If we take a look at the home page, you can see that that attribute directive lives on those images, shows message when hovered, and there's a message attribute, uh, and it swaps out the uh, original message up here with the value here on mouse um, enter and restores the original message on mouse leave. So, uh, you know, how do we how do we get a handle to this? What kind of testing strategy do we want to use? We don't really want to have a lot of fidelity here. Uh, I definitely don't want to have to add attach anything to the DOM. And Angular makes uh, that um, that desire really easy in 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 testing this stuff. So, let's do that. So instead of a before each given, just maps to before each. So we can say uh, given the module of app and given inject. Uh, we're going to need a scope uh, for this thing. Let's just pop that guy. Show this message when hover so we can see the code under test here. So we're going to inject that root scope. We're going to need that because that's where the message is going to live. And uh, we're going to need something called compile. So for our controller test, we injected controller. For directives, uh, there's two phases. There's a compile and a link phase. And we're not going to do link because link actually uh, will bind that um, that directive uh, for, to a piece of DOM, and we don't need to do that in order to test. So uh, let's set up our initial message. Uh, Ralph is here, and at is the CoffeeScript shorthand for. I can display the JavaScript. This, so you can see there's there's the JavaScript. Um, so given we're going to inject this stuff. Um, the next thing I need is the actual HTML that uh, sort of describes how my directive is going to be used. So let's create a div and have shows message when hovered. And we'll include a message. And the default value using CoffeeScript string interpolation is that directive message. And I'm just going to make this big again so you can see the whole thing. And we're going to need a scope. Again, we can say root scope dot dollar new to get us an instance of a scope. Uh, we want to set the value of the message equals uh, uh, something called original message. And things are looking grim. And let's again, I'll display the JavaScript for you people. So this dot scope dot message equals this dot original message equals uh, things are looking grim. That's just a bit of shorthand to uh, assign the same value to two uh, to two props to uh, places scope.message and, and the variable called original message. And let's use that compile that we injected. So we want to call compile, and compile takes uh, some HTML and then a scope, uh, which returns a function that takes a scope. And so that's all we need in order to be able to test, uh, to make assertions against this thing. So let's describe um, the stuff that we want to assert here. There we go. Uh, so when a user mouses over the element, and now we can use when. Um, we can interact with that by saying trigger handler, mouse enter. And our range act assert steps basically become uh, the descriptors. You can have a then with just a function argument, which is what these single arrows are in CoffeeScript. So when uh, describing when a user mouses over the element, when we trigger that handler, uh, then uh, we can say the message on the scope is set to the message attribute 
of the element. And now I can just say scope.message equals at directive message because that is the value that we stuck on this thing here. So let's spin up test them again. I killed it when I ran my uh, protractor stuff. There we go, two tests are complete. You can see the Jasmine runner there uh, and the nicely formatted messages. So the directive shows message when hovered. When I'm user mouses over the element, this message is set. Uh, let's make it fail so we can see what happens there. And Jasmine given formulates the error messages that come back to Jasmine uh, with a little bit of sugar. Um, and so we can see that uh, I didn't have to use expect because uh, everything in CoffeeScript is an expression. So if I actually evaluate this and show you what the JavaScript looks like. There we go. And let's show them side by side. Oh, we got like eight lines versus four lines. So it's usually a factor of two reduction. But uh, you can see that the last thing that this uh, function does is return um, this.scope.message uh, triple equals the Ralph, which it obviously uh, doesn't. And uh, I could also use expect, which is built into Jasmine. This is um, uh, an assertion mechanism uh, to be Ralph. And if we go to the test and runner, now we can see these, this is sort of what you expect from vanilla Jasmine. Expect Ralph was here to be Ralph. And if I put this guy back at directive message, there. Now we're good. So that those are just some options that you can have uh, when you're writing your specs. Jasmine Given uh, and CoffeeScript are a nice uh, sort of alternative. Oops, uh, in CoffeeScript you don't actually have to write triple equals. You can just write double equals. Let's write another spec. Um, so when a user's mouse leaves the element, and we've already got our given sort of as the before each up here with our inject to set up the state of the element. It's going to run that before each describe block. So given all of that stuff, um, when let's trigger mouse leave, and then um, the message is reset to the original message. And again, because everything in CoffeeScript is an expression, we can just say uh, original message, which we assigned up here. There we go. Let's look at the directive and make that fail. So instead of attributes.message, let's say food. And you can see that that failed. And we can see the, the, the output in the console is a little different than um, the output here, just the formatting of it. But we can say that that, that then clause returned false. Yeah, so let's go make that pass again. Uh, attribute stop message. There we go. And so you can see the whole time that my tests are, or that my files are changing, uh, I'm integrating against those tests. And so that is sort of the power of um, tests that have less reality. They can run really fast. Uh, let's just recap kind of some of the, the advantages to um, Angular's testing of directives. I didn't actually need to inject anything into the DOM. I can just you know create this arbitrary HTML string uh, I can sort of reveal the intent of how this directive is supposed to be used by just placing that attribute on this element. Uh, I can grab a scope, set some properties that the directive is going to be using, and then I can call Angular's compile facility uh, with that HTML, and then which returns a function that I can pass a scope to. That's as simple as it is to test uh, directives and controllers, uh, services. There's nothing magic about uh, testing services. If we wanted to test our authentication service, we could do something similar to how we tested login um, by spying on, uh, let's take a look at the authentication service. We could spy on HTTP post. We could spy on uh, and assert that login was called with credentials, logout was called. 
or we could uh, use HTTP backend like we did here and train it to uh, respond in a certain way uh, and, and verify some things uh, in that regard. Let's see if I covered all the bases in what I wanted to talk about. So recapping. Um, testing is hard uh, because we've got all this terminology uh, for things, um, but really the, the question that we need to be asking is how much reality do our tests need? Uh, and if we can determine that, sort of uh, incorporating it into a testing strategy for our application that uh, uses, you know, a few high-fi, high-fidelity tests uh, and some manual testing, uh, but the majority of our uh, testing uh, is low-fi, uh, cheap to run and automate uh, that verify the behavior. Uh, if you're doing TDD, that can also help shape the code design. Uh, that's a topic for a different screencast. Um, yeah, so that is uh, basically, uh, we looked at the boundaries in our application and, and talked about how different testing strategies are covering different pieces of those. Uh, and then this, uh, this idea of low res versus high res and some of the tools that we used. Um, so I hope that this screencast has helped you and that you'll be able to uh, talk with your team about some of these things. You know, talk, if anything, just about what test strategy we're going to use when testing our AngularJS applications. And I've given you a, a couple of tools. You can check out Wineman. You should definitely check out Protractor because it uh, it is it's going to replace the Angular Scenario Runner. So uh, it's it's worth checking out. Um, you can check out Lineman if you want to uh, write rich web applications. We've got all of these uh, testing tools baked in uh, in the Lineman Angular template. Uh, which is what I used for this screencast. So you can check that out. And I'll include links to all this stuff. Um, so hopefully that gets you up and running with uh, testing and cover some testing strategies with AngularJS.